Hi, my name is Ryan. I am of Moscow, a Neapolitan wood-fired pizzeria that is deaf-owned and deaf-led. Did you catch all of that? No? Don't worry. There's nothing wrong with your audio. But if you're deaf, this is the type of information that escapes us every day. Even with the use of captions or sign language interpreter supports. For example, I struggle taking notes in meetings while also having to watch the interpreter because I turn into a bobblehead while also being attuned to the conversation at hand, to the point that my notes look like this. This is just one of the many small ways in which society, even today, is not fully mindful of inclusion. How do we change that? Well, it starts with creating opportunities for deaf people. Today, I'm here to talk about how creating opportunities for deaf people is not just the right thing to do, but the smart thing to do. People seem to think accommodations for deaf people, such as sign language interpreters, assistive technology, cause headaches and cost time as well as money. But that's not the whole story. Deaf people in all their diversity bring incredible value and talent to any situation. Accommodations or sign language interpreters actually give you access to us. Working with deaf, deaf blind, deaf disabled, or hard of hearing people is an advantage. I don't have hearing loss. I have what's known as deaf gain. This is a term that describes how a deaf person provides value in a way that no other person can. Instead of looking at what we have supposedly, quote, lost, deaf gain really encompasses everything we as deaf people have yielded. The beautiful thing about deaf gain is that it is not just deaf people who benefit. With the right mindset, everyone does. Today, I'll show you ways you can break away from the old framework of loss and tap into the power of deaf gain. This is my story. Communication was always a challenge for me growing up in Nebraska. I was one of a few deaf students at a public school filled with hearing students and teachers. Back then, I had no idea what deaf gain was, but looking back, it's clear. My freshman year, I decided to ask a hearing senior girl to be my homecoming date via an old school TTY, a teletypewriter. I would dial in a relay service number, then put the phone handset on this big clunky typewriter looking machine that I was told made sounds like an old modem. Remember that? I typed something like, Stephanie, would you be my homecoming date? I waited and waited in what seemed like an eternity as the operator relayed my message to Stephanie in a flat, monotone voice with that annoying keyboard clattering sound in the background with my heart thumping and after what seemed like forever, she accepted. But I never asked anyone out over the TTY ever again. Talk about awkward silence. Because we're constantly playing catch up with communication, deaf people are generally early adopters of comms tech. We are eager to try out anything that could enhance the way we connect with each other, especially because of existing communication barriers. After TTYs, we had video relay service, known as VRS where a deaf person has access to a live in-person operator facilitating communication in real time. Then came along the QWERTY keyboard on cell phones like Sidekicks and Blackberries. While we were busy texting, we were also using apps like Glide, Zoom, FaceTime, all before that technology became so mainstream like it is today. Perhaps this is why we are viewed as the original hipsters. 
Not only are we early adopters of creative solutions, but we are also natural born problem solvers. Hearing people tend to feel flustered and uncertain of how to communicate with us, but what they don't realize is we're experts in communication and in overcoming communication challenges. Whether high tech or low tech, we find creative ways to improve our lifestyle and experiences. Deaf people believe in thinking differently. We are not the status quo, and we embrace that. That's deaf gain. Another reason we adapt well in tough situations is because we're used to being uncomfortable. Let me share another high school story. I played offense and defense on the football team, so I needed constant interpreting support while on the field. Imagine how difficult it was to read lips with the player's helmets, face masks, and mouth guards while trying to watch the interpreter up and down the sidelines. Because my interpreter was female, I missed out on the locker room banter between players. During halftime, my interpreter would have to wait outside the locker room until I flagged her to come back for the coach's halftime pep talk. I remember feeling uncomfortable, like I was such a burden to the players and coaches because I invited the interpreter into our circle. This pressure of being a burden made me feel like I had to perform especially well, both on and off the field, to make up for their sacrifice. But this discomfort can also promote personal growth from within. My being uncomfortable taught me how to communicate my needs to others while building my self-confidence, navigating a variety of situations in life. By the way, while we're talking about football, did you know that the huddle was invented by Paul Hubbard, a deaf football player at Gallaudet University? Like I said, we're creative communicators. That's deaf gain. I moved to Washington, D.C. after graduating from the University of Arizona. I was young and excited to join the workforce. While living in D.C., I thought it would be a neat experience to work on Capitol Hill. Because I knew that deaf people were frequently turned down from jobs, and still are today, I looked for ways to get an edge. So I asked the front desks at different congressional member offices, what's the most popular way to submit job applications? They all said candidates usually applied through email. But they also told me they were overwhelmed with email inquiries from constituents and lobbyists. I saw that and took it in as an observation. Here's where I used my problem-solving superpower. As someone who lives in a visual world, I took in my surroundings and noticed their fax machines weren't being used much. I could see they had very few printouts and were just sitting there collecting dust. A light bulb went off. I blasted out applications using fax machines at Kinko's while burning the midnight oil at 10 cents per page. And sure enough, my application grabbed the attention of several offices that were likely fed up with emails. By thinking outside the box, I ended up working for a United States Senator in an entry-level management position before moving over to the House side to work in finance. I ended up working on the Hill for five years. I continued to apply creative solutions throughout my career from the Hill to a reputable management consulting firm and then to a place I never imagined working, not even in my wildest dreams, the FBI, where I spent eight years. My primary responsibility was to provide strategic advisory services to the executive associate director, who 
who were really way up there in the FBI hierarchy. The FBI was where I fully realized my deaf game. FBI teams rely heavily on visual cues to be effective in their work. My deaf gain was a competitive advantage when analyzing mountains of data, observing people, and monitoring complex situations. When deaf gain isn't necessarily successful in getting us the jobs of our dreams, we don't give up. We problem solve and create opportunities for ourselves. Deaf people are more than twice as likely to become business owners. Talk about grit and unleashing our deaf gain. Oh, and one more thing. One advantage we have is that we can eat and talk at the same time. Mm, delicious. I was most fortunate to have two very supportive parents, both from the education field, who were true accessibility advocates. They'd always go to bat for me and my older sister, who is also deaf, to make sure we had access to a quality education and fulfilling experiences growing up, such as participating in different activities. They both also learned and were fluent in sign language which you may be surprised to find out is not very common for deaf children with hearing parents. My parents taught me the importance of advocating for myself and others, especially my community. I fully recognize that my situation is rare and our community, which has many advocates, is still a small one. That's why we need people like you to become advocates too. This is why I'm committed to creating opportunities for deaf people. And as a result of this talk, I hope you'll join me in doing so. At Mazaria, we are giving back and creating pathways for other deaf people in the same way my parents and other influential people throughout my life created for me to build an equal, accessible future, we all have roles to play. Opening our restaurant in DC couldn't have happened without the wholehearted support of community members and advocates and valued partners, such as the Communications Service for the Deaf Social Venture Fund, CSD-SVF. The SVF focuses on opportunity creation and providing entrepreneurial support as well as resources for deaf-owned businesses looking to scale and thrive. That's another thing. Deaf people are big on supporting what we call the deaf ecosystem by helping other deaf businesses and organizations succeed. In order to build an equal future, we must also empathize more with each other's individual experiences and support the various ecosystems that we are all a part of through our intersectional identities. We must encourage family members, educators, coaches, and employers to empathize with deaf people. Really, it's simple. Don't look at what deaf people can do, or the associated costs, or the hassles this might bring. Instead, recognize what deaf people can do and value what they bring to the table. Hire deaf employees, encourage and support deaf businesses in their momentum towards success. Look into content creators who are deaf and discover deaf gain for yourself. In turn, you'll be helping us empower a diverse, marginalized community just like we do here at Mozzaria, one pizza at a time. Thank you.